Hello and welcome to episode 15 of What's Tom Reading? I'm Tom and today is a special short holiday episode of the podcast where we're going to be giving out some thank yous and some acknowledgements and some appreciations and some best wishes. We're going to talk about some of the uh, accomplishments of the podcast and some goals for next year. Um, We're also going to talk about a very interesting uh, and chilling, actually, academic paper that I read called Universe 25 by Dr. John B. Calhoun. The paper documents an experiment in which the doctor, he created a perfect mouse utopia that unexpectedly and savagely destroyed itself. So if you're interested in the psychological implications that come along with something like that, and you have a little bit of time this holiday season to listen, then stay tuned. Right. So as I said, welcome to episode 15. This is our special holiday episode. So I'm going to keep this nice and short for you, but also for me, as you can no doubt hear by what's in my voice. I am unfortunately very sick right now. Um, in fact, this is this is maybe the sickest I've ever been. Um, my my wife and I have been for the last few days uh, since Christmas Day, actually, which is you know a big bummer for our family. We we were visiting extended family, and we all took very ill on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and so uh, it's it's been kind of a rough holiday season for us. A big. Uh, uh, Coughing, sore throat, headaches, chills, fevers, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, the whole the whole nine yards, right? The whole the whole um, raft of symptoms. Um, I went in and I got tested for that special uh, virus that's been on everybody's mind for the last couple of years. And uh, I tested negative. So um, I don't know what it is that we have, but whatever it is, is killing us. Um, And so. We're hoping, you know, that, (coughs) excuse me, we're hoping that we'll be up on our feet again really soon. But I I wanted to, um, I I had intended to record something uh, a little bit Christmassy, a little bit uh, on brand. But as I said, uh, Christmas Eve, when I would have sat down to record my Christmas message, um, uh, we basically felt like we were all going to die. So uh, that ship has kind of sailed. And so now I'm kind of focusing on more of like a new year's sort of message. And, um, that's, that's kind of where I want to go. So first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I started this podcast, it's been a few months now. Um, and we are 15 episodes in and that pace for me has felt, um, it's felt okay. Um, I, and some feedback that I've gotten is that, you know, I could either stand to, um, I, I could stand to produce more of these. Um, I, I produce them about as quickly as I read. So that either means that I need to read smaller books or read more quickly, dedicate more time to reading. And that's kind of what my new year's resolution is. Actually, I'm, I'm setting a goal for myself for 2022 and, you know, I know we all thought that 2021 was going to be our year, but 2022, this is, it's going to be our year, you guys. 2022, I'm going to read 100 books. That's my goal. I'm pretty close to that level already. I've never really tracked it. I've never really, you know, paid attention specifically to see how many books I've read in a year. I usually just kind of read just kind of as I feel like it. But I'm going to really try to put down a good number of books in this coming year, Um and so that should be in more podcast episodes, right? I don't know if I'll be able to get every single book that I read as a podcast episode, but I'm going to try. I'm going to make sure that they're good and interesting and awesome books. The support that I've been getting for the podcast is just incredible. You guys are so kind. The feedback that I've been getting is really making this whole uh, endeavor super worthwhile. You guys are the reason why I'm um, up tonight with you know with my sickness um to to send you a little holiday message and and to talk a little bit about uh this paper that i read 
because uh, it's just it's so satisfying for me to see that um, the things that I'm reading and then talking about are having some kind of an impact out there. I really, really appreciate it. Um, that said, let, let's do whatever we can to, you know, of course, grow the podcast. So if you know anyone who would be interested, any podcast listeners in your life who might be looking for something new, um, please uh, send them over to the show and we'll see We'll see if I can't uh, perform well enough to, to earn their attention. So... That said, I, I want to tell you guys that I really appreciate you. I have uh, I have a lot of respect for you guys' opinions, for the feedback that you've given uh, to help improve the podcast thus far. If you have more uh, information to send, then uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you want to email me, that's totally possible. Let me just let me just check and see what my email address is here. I, I wanted to say, but let me make sure. That I know what it actually is. So yeah, it's just what's Tom reading at gmail.com. I thought I got that one. So yeah, I got that domain there, that email address. So what's Tom reading at gmail.com. You can send that, uh, any, any advice, any tips, any suggestions for books that you'd like for me to read or review. Um, I'd really appreciate that. I have uh, a number of recommendations from, from listeners that I'm going to, um, start reviewing, um, very soon, right, right at the first part of 2022. So, um, as of this recording, it is the 30th of December. And so I wanted to, um, I'm going to deviate from our standard podcast formula here. I'm not going to do the, uh, the first half, what I like, we're not going to do science corner, history corner, random corner. And then what I didn't like, we're not going to do the rating of the bells. I just wanted to take some time to, um, talk about something that was just really, really interesting that I read. And this is kind of a unique thing because this, this is actually an academic paper that I read. And usually I find as any of you who have ever read academic papers, um, I usually find most of them tedious and, you know, overwritten and, you know, wordy and pretentious and yada, 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 you, you know, the drill, right? They're not exactly written for, you know, an audience, but this one I actually thought was very, very fascinating. And I wanted to share it. Um, I actually heard about this, this experiment on another podcast. And I thought I'm definitely looking that up. I'm definitely gonna find out more about that. So I read the whole paper. I read the methods section and everything like that. So, um, and, um, I'll comment a little bit on the methodology. Uh, well, actually, you know what? I, I won't spend that much time because we're not, like I said, we're not doing f the standard podcast format here. So and to save in the interest of time, I'll just tell you up front, um, there's some questionable methodology in here. And the premise that the doctor, the good doctor is approaching this with, um, Dr. John B. Calhoun is his name. Um, the premise he's approaching this with, I, I disagree with fundamentally. And I think he's been, since the publishing of this paper has been proven wrong. I should also say that this paper was published in 1973. Um, and this was during a time in, at least in the scientific consensus, that everyone was very, very, very worried about overpopulation. And now um, we're looking towards the future and it seems like we're, we're quite worried about underpopulation. Um, and <clears throat> this this paper might actually shed some light on that. So uh, let's let's jump into this and talk about it for a second. And I'm going to tie it into a nice, um, hopefully kind of a nice, <coughs> excuse me, a nice coherent um, message going forward into the new year for us to kind of kind of leap off onto. So uh, the this paper is called universe 25 and universe 25 is the mouse utopia that dr calhoun and his associates made and let me just describe the utopia to you so it's in this warehouse it's temperature controlled there's airflow um it's basically set it up to basically be like a dream situation for mice so it's nine foot so it's a nine foot sided square so, you know, 36 square feet or whatever, um, that is, or sorry, the perimeter is 36 feet and it's four and a half feet tall. And the whole thing is just filled with everything that a mouse could ever dream of wanting in its life. Perfect temperature, more food than they could possibly eat, clean water, absolutely no diseases present, abundant bedding that's regularly changed out, uh, play areas, open floor, um, brood chambers, all these things, right? And to give you an idea so you can visualize this, 
the brood chambers are built vertically um, into the wall. And there's like ladders and ramps and things like that. And the food and the water, it's all kind of in the walls. Um, and that's that's what the mice prefer as sort of their natural habitat. And there's a big open floor area in the middle that the mice, um, they they avoid it, but they like being able to avoid it, it seems. So like um, the, the, having it there gives them a wall to scurry against. And, you know, they can cross into the middle of the floor if they're feeling adventurous and frisky or whatever, right? Like... <clears throat> It's the perfect mouse habitat. They did a bunch of experimentation to find the right habitat for them. And then this is the one that is the most suitable in every possible way to mouse maximum um, vitality. So the whole thing is built to be able to comfortably home at least 3,480 mice without crowding them beyond like their natural kind of comfort levels, their natural, uh, what, what you would expect to maybe find in a similar similarly abundant natural environment like a grain silo or something like that so initially at the start of the experiment the doctor selected four breeding pairs of mice so eight mice total that came from laboratory stock so these are as genetically identical to each other as they can get them basically and the mice were selected and then isolated for 21 days shortly after weaning to make sure that they didn't bring any diseases or other abnormalities into the experiment with them they were all tested they were all healthy and so then the experiment began and <clears throat> the doctor released them into the environment and um all of the mice as i said they they, they seemed perfectly normal and were introduced into the utopia and for the first 55 days the eight mice did essentially nothing except for explore their surroundings in great detail they got used to each other they uh, ate food from a bunch of different machines they kind of mapped their surroundings and it took them about 55 days before they did anything other than that but after the 55 days they began to multiply very quickly and in that way that basically only mice can do um, they their population doubled and then doubled and then doubled again uh, based basically every 45 days. And it, it was an incredible growth rate initially, um, but the growth rate kind of tapers off. So, and here's the reason why. So the second generation mice, they were raised by the first generation in separate parts of the universe, basically wherever the females decided to wander off in the utopia and <coughs> build their nest. Um, that's where these little mouse tribes began to spring up and grow. And a dominant male mouse asserted control over the brooding area and kind of held like that territory. And the other male mice kind of held their own territories and it was all, all was well and fine. And the mouse population grew to fill a, a lot of the space of the universe. And the, the dominant male mice kept the territories more or less in balance and allowed the female mice to be comfortable and good mothers and nurturing and do all the things that mouse mamas do to raise their babies right. However, because this mouse utopia is perfect, there's no other pressures and no other predators. There's no cold, there's no sickness, there's no anything like that. There's no shortage of food. And so the population begins to grow very rapidly. And what starts to happen is um, the... It, so in nature, um, old mice get got, right? They get killed by something. They're, they slow down and then they're not fast enough to make it happen. They're not, you know, their senses aren't as quickly tuned and then they get killed. But in this situation, the old mice are just running around. And so the original you know, eight mice that they put in, the mice can live to be like a lot older than they are reproductively viable. A mouse hits menopause at about 575 days. And these mice are like well into 800 days. <clears throat> and from a population perspective, these, these older mice are just kind of in their dotage. Like they, they don't help raise the offspring. They don't really help do anything, but these old, old males are still trying to hold onto their territory and they're engaged in dominance displays that the younger males, um, in nature, they would usually just leave, but because they're all kind of crowded together, they, they start to kind of fight and, um, they don't really know how to deal with each other because they're not really handling the territory disputes very well and so an interesting thing starts to happen with the unsuccessful males because there's just there's an overall surplus of mice and so the females are getting kind of 
<clears throat> sorted into all these brooding areas. They're, they're joining into like clumps and packs with each other. And then males are taking over those areas and mating with all the females and, and, you know, doing what normally happens with the mouse world. But normally there's a lot of predators around and things like that to keep the population in check. And that's not happening in this case. So every baby mouse is growing up. And so there are, uh, there's a huge surplus of male mice. And there, there's a surplus of female mice as well, but you know the the dominant male mice don't mind that they'll they'll mate with as many females as they can, right? So right now the females aren't a problem, but there's a there's a huge surplus of males, and something interesting starts to happen with all these unsuccessful males who aren't able to stake out a piece of territory for themselves. They just sort of leave the utopia and they walk out into the middle of the floor at like the center of the universe, and they just sort of pile up on top of each other like and hardly move the doctor observed one day that a pair of mice a pair of these um involuntarily celibate in cell mice um they went to get a drink one day and then they came back and they they spooked one of their neighbors who then turned and viciously attacked another mouse and then that mouse just laid there and hardly struggled at all as he was savaged brutally by this scared mouse. Um, when the attack finally stopped, though, the injured mouse then turned and brutalized another neighbor in turn. And, you know, after some time had passed, most of these incel males were just lying around in the middle of the floor, badly scarred and wounded, periodically savaging and even eating each other. Right. They're not really doing anything except for just lying around. They're like the I don't know, like the 4chan or Reddit, you know, <laughs> I don't I don't know what you like the Internet troll in involuntarily celibate males all stacked up in the same area. And they're just tearing each other apart. But at the same time, they're not really doing anything like they hardly move at all. They don't play. They don't um, they don't fight except for to occasionally like try to eat each other. Basically, Um, it's a crazy thing that that happens. Um, But the the other kind of interesting thing is that there starts to become these female counterparts that are. Um, they're not successfully reproducing for their own reasons. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that very soon, but <clears throat> suffice to say for now that there are groups of female mice that are retreating as well and not, not reproducing, but they're, they're not as violent at all. They basically are piling up together high up in the walls and they don't breed. They just kind of eat and lay around and don't do anything. Um, but another thing that's very interesting is for some reason, the mice start to forget how to be mice and they start to focus the hyper focus on just a few territories inside of the utopia. And they leave some of the prime brooding areas basically abandoned. The prime nesting spots are basically abandoned and the dominant male mice, um, the the ones that still remember how to do it, they basically start getting super tired of defending their territory since so many of the young male mice and the young female mice don't seem to understand how defending territory works. They don't seem to get it. They So these dominant male mice, the old guard, they're just having to beat up and beat up and beat up these young male mice that don't know what's happening. And then they're trying to like corral these young female mice into their harem. And the young female mice are like, nah, man, I'm just here to get something to eat. And so, you know, and... and uh, an interesting thing about mouse physiology um, when mating is that the the female mouse has to be receptive. To the, like a male mouse can't rape a female mouse, right? Like like the female mouse has to do a thing called, um, I think it's called lordosis, where she like kind of arches her back and tips her butt up into the air. Um, and, and that signals her receptiveness to the male. And without that specific movement, um, the, the mating can't actually happen. <clears throat> it's a very specific movement that has to happen. And the female mice seem to have kind of forgotten how to do it. And the male mice, they're not shadow boxing each other anymore. They're not really um, engaged in like regular male activities that kind of prepare them for their part in the mating, um, like, you know, play mounting or whatever. And so the males kind of seem to forget how to breed as well. And so they're always wandering around past each other. And so these dominant male mice that were still defending their territories, they get super sick of it. Um, and so they stop doing it, but, um, 
once this behavior is lost, it's never again exhibited by male mice in the utopia. And after the males quit protecting the nest sites, the breeding females become hyper agitated and aggressive, and they'll attack any mouse that comes near or into their nest. And they even begin turning against their own babies, wounding them, killing them, and driving them away well before normal weaning would normally like occur. And so these poorly raised young mice then wander out into the universe badly adjusted and having already experienced violence at the hands of their own mothers. And they in turn grow up to be yet poorer mothers and fathers to their own offspring if they manage to drum up the will or ability to mate. And so eventually we end up in a situation where baby mice are being sort of like dragged around the utopia. They're abandoned and eaten more often than not. And the research team starts to really struggle to keep track of the population during this time period because a new um, litter of mouse pups might be scattered and or consumed by the next morning. Um, And it it seems that there's some kind of like glimmers of hope that some mice kind of attempt to restart normal mating habits and territory and, you know, different things like that, but they're unable to do that because there's just roving bands of badly adjusted, abused mice that are encroaching on their territory. And they've become accustomed to this violence and this kind of like blase way of living. And, um, Basically, by the time the founding generations are growing too old to reproduce, like I said, at around 575 days, um, it becomes clear that none of the mice who had been raised in this strange new social environment of the utopia are capable of reproducing. The females remain celibate or they like abandon their offspring uh, or eat their offspring or just like drive them out of the nest before they're you know, mature enough to basically be socialized enough to be mice and the males who are rejected, they just go and join freaking the 4chan pile on the floor and eat each other. And the rest of the males, um, the researchers start, the researchers start to kind of call them. And I think this is pretty creepy, but they call them the beautiful ones. And these males climb up to the very highest place and they just feed and groom and pamper themselves incessantly nonstop. And they have like this shiny, coat and they're fat and they're like really you know prime healthy they spend a lot of their day sleeping and eating and grooming and grooming and grooming and sleeping and eating um and these are like large healthy beautiful male mice but they don't exhibit any propensity towards mating with a female mouse at all And from this moment, obviously, the population of the utopia begins to decline Uh, in nature. These old mice, like I said, get eaten. But in the utopia, they end up just kind of bumping around in the halls, going senile and just dying of old age or from random acts of violence. The males obviously declined more quickly than the females, thanks to, like I said, the 4chan floor where they're all eating each other. Um, But the females are not doing great either. And to make sure that the experiment was doing as they thought it was, researchers would periodically remove a few mice um, and deposit them into new pens that weren't crowded, or they'd put them in with like normal mice from functional populations. And these, these mice that were badly socialized in the utopia, they still weren't able to figure out how to reproduce at all. And the surplus of food seems to have played a part in their loss of social structure because like like I said, half of the utopia isn't even used at this point. So that, like I said, the population um, density that they can comfortably fit. So hypothetically, they can fit the 5,000 mice up in here and they'd be pretty crowded, but they can comfortably fit, you know, 3,400 and the population peaks at 2,200. So not even close. They're, they're essentially not using about 40% of the utopia and it's because these there's so, so much food that there's no competition for the resources. And so they don't even really bother to go and find new places to nest. They just kind of forget that that's a thing that they're supposed to do. And the, like the males stop having to really care about territory because there's just such an abundance of all of the things that a male mouse in the wild would usually try to hold on to and protect for his, you know, for his females who are nesting there. Um, and so basically the abundance of resources kind of kind of chokes out these natural instincts and these natural instincts are tied into all of their social behaviors and their social behaviors are tied into all of their mating behaviors to the point where without them, 
they without these social upbringings, they literally forget how to mate. Like they they don't practice it, they don't see it, they don't witness it, they don't understand it. They're badly adjusted. They're abused by their mothers. They're abandoned by their fathers, and they go out into this mouse utopia. And there's all the food and water that they could ever need, all the bedding that they could ever need, but they don't know how to be mice because of that. <clears throat> it's very fascinating. Um, so they mix them in with these normal populations, as I said, and they, they can't figure it out. They're, they're basically broken. And the mice, they're essentially split into celibate females, beautiful celibate males, and then the, the dwindling population of aggressive incel males on the floor. Some of the mice went mad, walking around and around in circles. Um, tests of the hormone balances of many of the mice revealed that they were all physiologically very stressed out in spite of the lack of environmental stressors. Um, which is very, very interesting um, as an analog to our own um, kind of lives, right? Um, and so this, this, like I said, this doctor, uh, <clears throat> he's sort of an old school uh, doctor from the 70s, right? So he took kind of an interesting approach to explaining the degradation of mouse society. And he, he thinks it's a, as an effect of overpopulation. And he feared that human populations were going to do the same thing someday. However, I disagree with his premise, and so do a lot of the people who have been critical of his paper. Um, I did read some of the peer reviews of this uh, as well, just to try to be thorough. And a lot of them point out that the mouse population never got past 2,200, which is, like, like I said, it's about half uh, or 60% of what ought to have been able to live comfortably in the utopia, let alone before any serious crowding, right? And so it seems that the, like I said, lack of competition for resources disincentivized traditional territorial male behavior, which disincentivized nurturing female behavior, which meant that successive generations grew to adulthood, badly adjusted and socialized, and each generation grew worse and worse until the entire population just failed to thrive. And the <clears throat> the incel 4chan males ate themselves alive. The beautiful one males just hung out and pampered themselves. And the largely celibate females just busied themselves with grooming and eating and attempting to socialize, but poorly. And if they ever did become pregnant, they would just abandon or kill their babies. And... <clears throat> Something that I, I, I wanted to read this passage. It's directly from the paper and it's from the conclusion section of it. Let me just let me just grab that real quick. Um, <clears throat> and he has kind of this highfalutin kind of hoity toity way of writing that I thought was actually really um, kind of interesting because it's it's uh, it's pretty rare. Right. And he's he's uh, he's obviously got an agenda when he's written this paper. And I think that's I think that's pretty cool, actually. Um, when they're transparent about it. I, I hate when they try to hide the, I hate when academics and, or scientists try to hide their agenda behind, you know, that sort of like crusty, falsely objective, highfalutin lingo that a lot of them use. Whereas this guy, he has an ax to grind and he, he, he sells it as best he can um, in sort of an interesting narrative format here. So I'm quoting now directly from the conclusion section of the paper. <clears throat> So he says, within a few generations, all such roles in all physical space available to the species are filled. And he's talking about um, the um, social roles like like dominant male or subordinate male that's trying to become dominant over time, like in a bachelor group or like breeding female or juveniles. Right. Like there's all these roles in a, in a healthy mouse society. Um, <clears throat> And within a few generations, all such roles in all physical space available to the species are filled. At this time, the continuing high survival of many individuals to sexual and behavioral maturity culminates in the presence of many young adults capable of involvement in appropriate species-specific activities. However, there are few opportunities for fulfilling these potentialities. In seeking such fulfillment, they compete for social role occupancy with the older established members of the community. This competition is so severe that it simultaneously leads to the nearly total breakdown of all normal behavior by both the contesters and the established adults of both sexes normal social organizations i.e the establishment breaks down it dies Young born during such social dissolution are rejected by their mothers and other adult associates. This early failure of social bonding becomes compounded by interruption of action cycles due to the mechanical interference resulting for the high contact rate among individuals living in a high density population. It basically says they're all bumping into each other. High contact rate further fragments behavior as a result of the sto uh, stochastics of social interactions, which demand that in order to maximize gratification from social interaction, intensity and duration of social interaction must 
must be reduced in proportion to the degree that the group size exceeds the optimum. This is basically just saying they're they're crowded. They're bumping into each other and mm, they're having to spend less and less time with each mouse in order for every mouse to be able to spend some time socializing. That's just I don't know why they said said it the way that they did, but that's what they said. Anyways, to continue the quote. <clears throat> Autistic-like creatures, capable only of the most simple behaviors compatible with physiological survival, emerge out of this process. And I, apologies for, I, I'm quoting here directly, I, th I know autistic-like is uh, very insensitive, but like I said, this paper was written in the 70s, so um, anyways. <clears throat> emerge out of this process. Their spirit has died the first death. They are no longer capable of executing the more complex behaviors compatible with species survivals. The species in such situation dies. For an animal so simple as a mouse, the, more com the most complex behaviors involve the interrelated set of courtship and maternal care, territorial defense, and hierarchical intragroup and intergroup social organization. When behaviors related to these functions fail to mature, there is no development of social organization and no reproduction. As is in the case of my study reported above, and he talks about study, the members of the population will age <clears throat> and eventually die. The species will die out. <clears throat> and now here's where he gets to his his uh, finishing blow here, his little flourish. <clears throat> For an animal so complex as man, there is no logical reason why a comparable sequence of events should not also lead to species extinction. If opportunities for role fulfillment fall far short of the demand by those capable of filling roles and having expectancies to do so, only violence and disruption of social organization can follow. Individuals born under these circumstances will be so out of touch with reality as to be incapable even of alienation. Their most complex behaviors will become fragmented. Acquisition, creation, and utilization of ideas appropriate for life in a post-industrial, cultural, conceptual, technolog technological society will have been blocked. Just as biological generativity in the mouse involves the species' most complex behaviors, so does ideational generativity for man. Loss of these respective complex behaviors means death of the species. So this scientist is theorizing that <clears throat> what happened to the mice in Universe 25 in his little utopia could happen to humankind too. And it's something that I think we can think about here going into the new year. And I told you I'd try to tie it in. Obviously, humans are very different from mice. <clears throat> and the doctor, as I said, he tried to draw some parallels that I disagreed with fundamentally. And I'll be the first to say that his methodology is far from perfect here. Um, there were a few things that the peer review papers brought up that I thought, oh yeah, that probably would affect your outcomes. So I don't think this was a perfect experiment, but I think it, it does say something about nature. And it says something, if we're honest, about our nature. This study has actually been replicated to a large degree, pretty successfully. And one thing is certain if you remove the challenge, you kill the species. Now, I know 2020 stunk for a lot of people. It stunk for me. And 2021 wasn't any better. Um, we're coming into 22, 2022 here. And there's so many things about our society right now that, you know, when I read this academic paper, I thought, oh boy, we, we definitely have a lot of, you know, involuntarily celibate males, um, you know, simultaneously lounging around and eviscerating each other. Right. Um, we definitely have a lot of, um, hyper-focused on themselves, young men and women in the world. <clears throat> There's less focus on, you know, doing those things <clears throat> which are important to keep the species going, right? And I apologize, I'm losing my voice some way here at the end, but th that's probably a good indication that it's time to wrap it up. But as we go into 2022, I think we ought to try and stay hungry. I think we ought to try and open our eyes to the world around us to the responsibility, to the challenges that are out there. And instead of trying to make our lives easier by avoiding the challenges and leaning into that kind of fast food convenience, you know, iPhone, uh, Netflix kind of lifestyle that's so easy for us to do. And, you know, if we, if we do that, then pretty quickly we're going to be like these mice. We're going to forget what it means to socialize. And I think we can see some of the side effects in our political world right now of what happens when people start to forget what it means to socialize. There are things said on the internet. I've had things said to me on the internet 
that that no one would dare say to me to my face. And I'm not saying that because I'm a big, scary, intimidating guy, even though I kind of am. What I'm saying is that, you know, I'm also a nice guy and people don't like to say mean things to nice people to their faces. But on the internet behind a screen, you know, with, as a keyboard commando, people some for some reason feel in, empowered to say the most hideous, heinous things to strangers. And it's because we've forgotten what it means to socialize face to face. So dear listeners, I'm committing this coming year to living in this world, to dealing with people face to face. And even when I am on the internet to only speaking to people as I would speak to them in person, I'm committing to maintaining the most important aspects of humanity in my own life. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to get out into nature. I'm going to look after my wife and my kids. I'm going to, you know, set good goals. I'm going to aim for them. I'm going to try to keep myself off of technology as much as I can. I'm going to be Um, as productive as I possibly can and to lean, I'm going to try really hard in 2022 to lean into the struggle because if you remove the challenge, you kill the organism. And I think that's as true for us as it is for mice and every bit of data we have on, you know, the side effects of a sedentary lifestyle, right? Obesity and diabetes and heart disease and all these things that come along from the trappings of a life that's too easy. Uh, We just got to lean away from that. It's killing us and it's, it might be killing us slowly, but oh boy, Uh, I don't want to end up like these mice in universe 25. I think there's a lesson to be learned here. I don't think we're too far gone, not even close. I've got a lot of hope. I think that people out in the world are still by and large, very, very good. I think that we just need a wake up call. I think we need to run screaming away from the metaverse. I think we need to run screaming away from zoom work and zoom classrooms. I think we need to start seeing people face to face again, as soon as possible, maintain those close, intimate, personal interactions, be real with people, see real people, be outside, be physical, live in the material world and, uh, and get striving because, you know, remove the challenge, kill the creature. That's all for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. I am, like I said, I'm going to be um, working hard to put out as many podcasts as I can in the new year. Like I said, I'm, I'm shooting for a hundred books read uh, next year. I'm going to set a couple other goals. I'll maybe talk to you guys about those at that time. Like I said, thank you so much for your support. If you have any suggestions, you can email me at what's Tom reading at gmail.com. You can follow me on my Facebook page. Uh, if you like to support the podcast, um, give a couple of bucks or whatever. Uh, I have a Patreon on page set up. My wife uh, suggested that I get that set up. Thank you to those who have already um, jumped on there to support. I really, really appreciate that. It'll help keep me in books and help keep things coming. Um, You guys are the best. Thank you so much. I'm going to go and try and uh, get some sleep and (laughs) sleep off the the rest of this sickness. Uh, I love you guys. Be good to each other. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. 2022 is going to be our year. (laughs) 